this is a gas station in a bottle on steroids because this chemical is the gasoline smell concentrated by nearly 100 times. Just approaching it gives me gas station vibes and it's so strong it literally stings. I'm sure many of you guys love the smell of gasoline pulling up to a gas station just to get a few sniffs of that pungent, oddly sweet and pleasant scent. However, let me tell you that today, I will be making the only chemical responsible for that smell, which gives you cancer, blood disorders, reproductive issues, leukemia, death? So the next time you try to catch some whiffs of that odor, think again. I'll then be lighting it on fire to see how flammable it is, and it really surprised me. I'll be synthesizing this chemical with just two ingredients through a reaction called thermal decarboxylation, using just sodium hydroxide and sodium benzoate, a common and safe food preservative that I guarantee you've seen on food labels. Isn't it just so crazy how something we eat can become this toxic with just base and heat? The funny thing is, I don't even have sodium benzoate, only benzoic acid, so let's make that sodium benzoate first. When benzoic acid is added to water, it ionizes to form benzoate ions and hydronium. By reacting benzoic acid to sodium hydroxide, an acid-base reaction occurs where the sodium and hydrogen swap places, forming water and sodium benzoate. Now, I didn't have too many bottles of benzoic acid, so I decided to go with just 50 grams or 0.4 moles. After pouring that in, I went with the value I got from my molar calculations, which is corresponding to 17 grams of sodium hydroxide. Anyways, now we just have an aqueous solution of sodium benzoate. The thermal decarboxylation takes place only when the sodium benzoate is thoroughly mixed with the sodium hydroxide with maximum surface area. So it's better to add in the hydroxide into the solution than boil it down which is literally the maximum surface area we could ever possibly get. I can add in another 17 grams of sodium hydroxide to the solution and I turned on the heat and stirring and waited. I have no idea why but trust me, I am being 100% serious right now but this solution smells exactly and I mean exactly, absolutely, nostalgically like Pokemon cards. Does anyone know a reason for this? Maybe it's like a chemical in their printing process or something. Also, the sodium hydroxide also formed these weird chunks which I had no idea why, so I had to painstakingly chop them up. While that's happening, let me tell you about today's sponsor- just kidding. Let me tell you about Benzene. I've been willing to make this video for a while now, as my profile picture is literally the mega form of Benzene. That's right, it's not the hybrid form, the mega form. Benzene, C6H6, is a planar aromatic hydrocarbon, and if you look at one bond line structure of benzene, there's another possible one by flipping each pi bond. See? There are two resonance structures, and they fuse together to form a resonance hybrid. There are multiple depictions for this hybrid, like the circle one or the dash one, but I made the hybrid of all hybrids, which is my channel picture. And also, yes, actually, the bond between each carbon is 1.5 bonds. Molecular orbital theory expands on this topic and describes its pi electrons as being delocalized, like donuts, but that's another story. To put it simply, it is the most beautiful organic compound ever, period. And don't disagree. Remember, hexagons are the bestagons, and so maybe cyclohexane might come close, but it's weird and bumpy and chair-shaped and doesn't even have resonance, only poking. Now when I came back to it after a few hours, I realized I may have left it on for a bit too long and the heat a little too high. We can see how the bottom has already decarboxylated and turned brown, producing some benzene vapors and leaving some sodium carbonate. Although the top unreacted part was delightfully easy to remove. So I crushed our extremely evenly mixed powder into an even finer powder and put it in the metal paint can. This is because this decarboxylation involves high temperatures and I don't want my glassware to be ruined. In order to make my 2440 glassware fit, I'm going to need to stab a hole in the lid with a screwdriver. And it was rough. Now due to all the imperfections, I went with a ton of Teflon tape on my distilling head. But even that wasn't enough, so I had to add on some duct tape. And if I haven't told you already, the vapors that are going to be released are extremely carcinogenic, so it is important to keep everything sealed. I am also wearing a respirator. So now I can finally put together the setup, and I don't know why but I opted for a hot plate which was a very bad idea. Anyways, I cranked up the heat and the pump, and this was when things took a turn for the worse. The toxic fumes still managed to leak everywhere, so I had to put on even more duct tape. And then, the duct tape started melting, and the reaction was barely proceeding, even with some insulation. Everything at the top started turning into a lump of goop, and maybe due to a variety of reasons, like temperature, 
my reaction made only a few disappointing drops of benzene. I thought I needed a bit more time, so I did leave it there. But even then, when I came back, nothing happened. Sorry, I was wrong. Something did happen. My thermometer somehow slipped through the adapter and melted. I mean, it couldn't get any worse. And it did. My three-way distilling head was also cooked, because there's no way that ground glass joint was going to be usable again. So yeah, in short, my first attempt was a disastrous failure. But maybe I shouldn't call it that. It's an opportunity to try again. And so I did. One week later, when I got new materials. This time, after doing some research, apparently people like Now Red used a ratio of 2 to 1 moles of sodium hydroxide to sodium benzoate, rather than the 1 to 1 from my calculations. Maybe this excess could promote this reaction and maximize products by increasing the surface area, but frankly, I'm not too sure why. Anyways, this time I decided to directly buy sodium benzoate off Amazon rather than trying to make it myself. This is because it is commonly sold as a food preservative. I also got an adapter and like last time, made a rough hole through the can lid. Although this time, I used a lot more Teflon tape and really made sure the seal was super airtight. I can then put on my new distilling head on top of this adapter so the glass joint won't get ruined. Now time to make the mixture. Similar to last time, this time I had to physically combine the two powders. To maximize surface area, I crushed up some sodium hydroxide pellets into a powder. The sodium benzoate was also already a powder so no need to further process it. Then dumping the two substances into a Ziploc bag and shaking it around vigorously for a bit, I felt that it was all evenly mixed. I could then dump this into a metal can, but it was very full. I decided to split up the reaction in two batches as the heat doesn't transfer that well into the top layers if it's too full. I dumped half of it into a large beaker and made sure to seal it as sodium hydroxide is extremely hygroscopic and will absorb water from the air to form a solution. Finally, I made the same setup as last time and turned on the condenser pump. This time, I made a change of plans and used a blowtorch, but it barely worked as well and doesn't really distribute the heat that well. So change of plans, I used the butane camping stove instead which gets quite hot. Soon enough, the reaction started occurring and some nice benzene vapors started climbing up and condensing in the condenser. It was very difficult to get the heat to a perfect amount such that the benzene vapors don't form too rapidly, overwhelming the condenser and passing into the collection flask, or too slowly such that it doesn't even reach the condenser. It was a bit of a trial and error, but eventually it did hit a sweet spot. It was extremely sensitive, kind of like the shower water. I just realized that I didn't even tell you what was happening here. This is a thermal decarboxylation which is the removal of a carboxylic group, or CO2, from a molecule with the help of heat and base. As you can see here in the equation, this CO2 part is torn off from the benzoate and gets used to make sodium carbonate. The carboxylic group is clear when circled here. It then leaves us with benzene, which is the impure white smoke that flows over and condenses, and leaves the sodium carbonate, which is washing soda, in the can. Some tar and a bunch of side products are also produced, which causes the weird orange color in the distillate. This type of lab procedure is also known as a dry distillation. Now it was quite rewarding that I collected a decent amount, and when no more smoke came over, I stopped the distillation and did the second batch of reactants. Again, the distillation proceeded smoothly. I also did a cold bath for the distillate to help minimize vapors and condense any that came over. Or I guess you could say snow bath, as Yes, I'm in Canada. And surprise, surprise, what's cooling my condenser? Although ice is much better. As both of the batches were finished, I was really glad I was left with about 100 mils of crude orange benzene. Now it was time for purification, as clearly, somehow, there's some weird dust-like substances inside there, and I'm not sure if the camera really captured it well. Any water-soluble impurities can be washed out using a separatory funnel. Each time, I poured in the benzene along with a bit of water, then I capped it and shook it, while also remembering to open the valve to let out any gas. I did three washings to ensure that I was left with a clean product, although I may have lost some benzene in the process as it is sparingly soluble in water. Anyways, now the clean crude benzene can be distilled again, and this time I used a hot plate. After setting up the distillation, I turned up the pump and the hot plate on medium heat, and the vapors were in the range of 65 to 72 for the entire distillation, which corresponds well to the boiling point of the water benzene azeotrope. I wasn't sure if I should include anything at about 65 to 68. It might be impure, but I just let it go in there. Anyways, some nice cloudy distillate came over, and I think I collected a decent amount at the end. 
I stopped it when the weird orange tar impurities started bumping like crazy, even with stirring on. You definitely don't want it to keep on going as that will make your pure benzene extremely impure if it bumps over. The reason the benzene is cloudy is because there's still some water in it, and this can be fixed by putting in some 3A molecular sieves, which absorb all the moisture. Immediately, a bunch of bubbling happened, meaning it was working. I left it here for about an hour or so until it became perfectly clear. Then, I transferred it into a graduated cylinder to measure 52 mils of benzene, which corresponds to a yield of about 75%, which is literally the highest yield I've ever seen for decarboxylations like this, not including the first few drops of benzene at the start of the video. I'm not sure if it was because my distillation was not strict enough, or maybe if it was because splitting it into two batches was significantly more efficient. Anyways, I transferred it into an amber bottle and stored it appropriately. Now to test the flammability of it, I dipped a cotton ball into the benzene and lit it on fire. It burned so well I don't think I've seen anything like it. The fire grew bigger and bigger and I think it lasted for about 2 minutes in total. Definitely surpassed my expectations. It does produce a bunch of toxic fumes as well that should not be inhaled. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video, and since you made it to the end, please consider subscribing. Thank you.